Hi, everyone. My name is Andrea Jonesroy, and I am here to talk about going back to the basics, five simple, hopefully simple techniques to make the most of your people data. Now, first of all, why do we need five simple techniques or any simple techniques? There is awesome stuff going on in data science, machine learning. We've seen a lot of stuff at this conference already. Why do we care about the simple stuff? Well, here are a few things that I'm observing and frankly feeling myself that suggest going back to the fundamentals could be helpful. One, I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm drowning in data, but also somehow at the same time don't have enough. I also find a lot of anxiety, especially when I talk to leaders of companies who are trying to work with data to better understand their people. They have this pressure that if they aren't doing you know, deep learning and neural nets, what are they even doing? Why are they even bothering if it's not the latest and the greatest? Finally, I find again and again, and I fall into this trap myself, is that we keep hoping that data and data science can do the hard work for us. If only we had the right data set or the right model, we wouldn't have to think or learn or change our own minds about anything, right? We hope that it's this panacea that can help us. Alas, all of these tensions are getting in our way of actually getting clear understanding of what we care about with our people data and frankly, lots of data. So before we go on, who am I and why am I talking about this? Well, I'm a professor of data science at New York University and the director of undergraduate studies at the Center for Data Science. So I spend a lot of time thinking and talking about how to be a data scientist, what good data science looks like, techniques, et cetera. I also work as a, com as a, I also work as a consultant with uh, huge global companies as well as small or more lean startups. Uh, and I typically help them with their data, uh, their people data problems. And I teach a course and I'm writing a book on data science for everyone. My belief is that everyone can be a data scientist if they're willing to put in the work. And I, I really hope that folks out there who might be intimidated by data science are not. And those who think that they must do the cutting edge can say, well, it also counts as data science if you're doing the fundamentals. Alert, there is a selection bias. I'm gonna give you some anonymized, modified examples of things I'm seeing companies struggle with when they work with their people data. Um, but there might be some selection bias because I tend to get called when companies say, I have this data and I have this problem, help me solve it with this data or what data should I get or evaluate the results of this study, help me with my model, et cetera. So it could be there are a lot of companies out there that are just killing it um, or a lot of companies that don't care about data. They're probably not at this conference. Uh, so I am seeing the ones who are saying, oh, I need some help, right? So maybe this isn't fully representative, but hopefully, well, not hopefully, I think it probably is. Okay, so my assertion to you today, one, we can do lots of awesome things with data science techniques like machine learning, deep learning, all kinds of stuff, so cool. But we can also learn a lot from much simpler techniques that you probably already know or maybe learned and forgot, or maybe you never learned them. Well, now is the time, right? And they're not as hard to learn as things like unsupervised machine learning. So also cool, and I know what you're thinking, and yes, I do do my own graphics, thank you. So my final assertion, not only are simpler techniques cheaper and faster, but, and this is heresy, you might also learn more, gasp, than with fancy methods. So cool, yes, oh my goodness. Oh, thank you, thank you, hold your applause. Please sit down, yes, thank you, thank you so much, okay. Now, all of you out there today, there's probably a diversity of folks out there. Some of you might be thinking, hooray, teach me some simple, useful techniques. In that case, I hope this talk offers some helpful tips. Many of you might be thinking, oh, I vaguely remember this stuff. And hopefully this talk will give you helpful reminders for things you already know uh, and maybe are rusty on. Or you might be in the third category, which is I not only know all of this, but I never wanna hear about it ever again. If we were in person, I would say something fun like, well, at least this talk will pass the time until drinks. But since we're all just at home, uh, you know, you can fold laundry while I'm talking. Keep listening just in case. But <laughs> Look at those towels, they're not gonna fold themselves. All right, we're done. Now, what are my simple techniques? One, be humble, but not afraid. Two, the scientific method to the rescue. Three, down with the tyranny of means. Four, this is gonna be controversial, but I'll say it, your obsession with statistical significance is probably leading you astray. And if you don't believe me, I put some stars, so now you know it's important. You don't know that, more on that. And finally, thou shalt not select on the dependent variable. Finally, I will ever so quickly give you a further airing of grievances uh, because there's always more problems that I have. All right, so step one, 
be humble, but not afraid. Famously simple, right? Now, I know this sounds like something that Jon Snow would advise to Samuel or someone else. Uh, and by the way, I like this picture because there's a random person back there. These are the people who didn't attend the conference. They won't learn to be humble, but not afraid. Eventually, we hope they will, right? But what I mean by that in the context of people data is your data probably isn't as good as you think it is, but that doesn't mean you have to throw it away. So a few reasons your data is probably not as good as you think it is. One, selection bias. Often when we're working with data, like the results of an engagement survey, we are not working with a random sample. Much of statistics is built on the assumption that we are working with a random representative sample. We are not. Measurement is a huge topic and it's my favorite. I love them all, but especially measurement. Uh, find me afterwards and let's talk measurement if you want to. You're probably not measuring what you think you're measuring. A lot of companies, when they want to measure talent, they measure something like leadership and they rate someone on a scale of one through five or whatever. I argue that often these leadership measures are just picking up how much you like someone. There are thoughtful ways that you can add further measures to maybe triangulate that, but generally speaking, companies aren't doing that. They're just saying, are you a leader? Yes or no, one through five, right? And I further know that they're not really validating their measures because sometimes over the years, the word will just change. And all of a sudden, rather than asking about leadership, we're asking about something like grit. Now, I know Angela Duckworth is presenting at this conference. I am a huge fan. I'm very into grit. She wrote an entire book defining and measuring grit. Not trivial, right? And the fact that companies are just swapping one word in and one word out and just using the same scale suggests we're not actually measuring grit. Talk to Angela about measuring that further. All right. Finally, I observe data siloing with people data. What this means is people will say, well, I have my performance data, I have my engagement data, and I have my DEI data. Rather, mix them all together. Here's what we do. Here's how to not be afraid. One, simple tweaks. You don't have to throw away your engagement survey data just because it's not representative. Just clarify what you're actually measuring. Instead of saying something like 90% of people would recommend this company to a friend, blah, 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 say 90% of people who took this survey to remember that there are a ton of people out there or some percentage that haven't taken it whose opinions you actually might be most interested in or at least very interested in. By the way, companies often throw this out, but the participation rates are data. If more and more people are not participating in your engagement survey over time, that's information. Ask yourself, how do I know I'm measuring what I think I'm measuring? There are techniques out there called conceptualization, which is what do I mean by the thing I'm talking about? Leadership, grit, and operationalization. How am I gonna turn that into a number? And how am I gonna go back and check the validity that I'm measuring what I want? I don't see companies taking that step. Also ask, what am I not asking about? I'm hyper-focused on leadership or grit. What else could I ask about? More on that in a moment. And remember that all data is DEI data, it's, and performance data in particular is not objective truth. There's similarity bias, there's what we're looking for in the first place, there's context that we have to take into account. Too often I see companies say, this person is a four, this person is a five, as though it's capital T truth. If you're not sure what I mean on the exclusion uh, piece here with, with asking about uh, what you're gonna ask about on a survey, for example, uh, think about your engagement surveys I have a lot of problems with engagement surveys, but we'll just uh, go to this point right here, which is uh, you want to make sure that you're asking questions that matter to the people you're asking. And one good way to do that is to first ask them what matters to you rather than just saying, do you feel you belong or do you feel whatever? And if you still don't believe me, uh, I invite you to think back to a simpler time when we had planes and airports. I don't know if anyone remembers that, but I used to fly Delta, no big deal. And after every flight, they would send me these surveys that made me angry. They would ask me questions like, were you greeted at the gate with a smile? And I would say, oh my God, I don't care. I care that the plane didn't crash on my way to where I was going. Ask me about that, right? Yes, no, <laughs> that's the whole survey. So make sure you're asking your people what they want about what they want to tell you. And how do you tell what they want to tell you? You ask them, okay. So to sum up, this is a long one, the rest will be shorter, but this is a big point, right? Here are the battles that we're fighting with our data. There's selection bias, there's measurement issues, there's siloing, the results, and I couldn't find a sword image, so we're using kitchen knives. So ask, who am I over and under counting in my data? How do I know I'm measuring what I want? And remember, performance data does not equal truth. Data about your people is data about your people. We don't have to keep it in separate categories. And for those of you who are like, wow, working with Andrea as a consultant must be really obnoxious. Uh, it is. This is pretty much the Andrea Jones Roy consulting experience. I have a lot of problems with your data and you're going to hear about it. All right. The rest of these will be faster. Okay. 
the scientific method to the rescue. If you aren't sure where to focus your analysis or what data to collect, start with a good old fashioned theory and hypothesis. It doesn't sound exciting, but it's helpful. Here's what I see most organizations do. They say, I care about DEI. Here are tons of metrics about demographic identity. Oh my goodness, women and black employees are more likely to leave. I better freak out and implement all kinds of best practices without actually thinking about whether they apply to me. So I might do something like form an ERG, conduct a survey and hope for the best or ask black employees about their experiences and then ignore the results because they're not statistically significant, more on that to come, and or dismiss their interviews as anecdotal. Instead, try the old scientific method and ask a question. Why are black talent leaving the company? Observe, they're more likely to leave. Have a theory, maybe it's a lack of inclusion. Come up with an observable implication based on that theory. Um, if you're getting talked, at, uh, talked over at meetings or interrupted, you don't feel you're included and you're more likely to leave. This is just one view, right? There could be a lot and probably ask black employees what they think as opposed to listen to me, think about what the issues might be. Now I know to collect data on speaking time. And if my theory is correct, I should observe that being interrupted predicts leaving. And if I do observe that, I can then refine my theory, explore more avenues and implement policy. The only two stages in our data analysis that actually involve data are observation and this collection and testing. Otherwise, it's all thinking. When we think data science, we tend to think spreadsheets and graphs and data dashboards, more on those in a moment, but it's actually mostly sitting and thinking really hard about what to look for and how to know if you've learned something. So in sum, if you're overwhelmed, don't know where to start or what data to get, Begin from a place of curiosity, ask questions, use a theory and a hypothesis to focus your analysis, and then look for observable implications. And then have a drink, why not? Well, or not, whatever. Three, down with the tyranny of means. There is a ton of value to starting simple. That's my whole point. But there are also lots of techniques that I see companies miss between the mean and machine learning. Right? A lot of times they say, this is the mean of the engagement rate of data. Now let's make a machine learning model of predicting it from now on, right? There's a ton in there that we're skipping. So I often see companies do things like this. They say, ah, the mean engagement scores between men and women are the same. There must be no bias. The mean performance scores between white and Asian talent are the same, no bias. Instead, try and hold on to your hats. This is very sophisticated. A histogram, yes. <laughs> I study and teach and practice data science, but I am telling you the most, the strongest value add I think I give to companies is, uh, a histogram in addition to complaining about data, right? Histogram, you see a very different picture. The means might be the same, but there are very different experiences of the people in your company from different groups. If you don't have it in you for histograms, just do the standard deviation, right? The mean for men is four, the mean for women is four, but the standard deviation for women is much higher. You're already learning something about the experiences of your people. Almost there. Your obsession with statistical significance is probably leading you astray. No, seriously, this is so important and I just cannot emphasize how much companies get fixated on this and miss important results. So what do I see companies do? I see companies observe things like, ah, the mean performance scores are 3.9 for women and 4.0 for men. And oh my gosh, the difference is statistically significant. Let's freak out and change everything. Or they say, hmm, the mean performance scores are 3.2 for Latino, Latina, and Latinx talent, and they're four for white talent, but the difference is not statistically significant, so snooze fest, I don't care. Whew, oh my goodness. Instead, I recommend remembering that statistical significance rewards sample size. If you are working with a population that is very small, the gap in the mean or whatever metric you're looking at, the gap between that population and another one must be much bigger for statistical significance to pick it up. Whereas if you're working with two large groups, say men and women at your organization, you're much more likely to pick up statistical significance with a small difference. So you're actively ruling out the experiences of minorities in your company by being hyper-focused on statistical significance. Instead, I don't, you don't have to throw it away. It's still a piece of information, but there's a lot else out there that you can think about. So focus on substantive significance. Is this a difference that's something I, a decent person who wants to run a fair and equitable company, am okay with? 3.2 versus four is not something I would be okay with. Last one, thou shalt not select on the dependent variable. So don't just study the outcome you want to understand. And this is a subtle point. What I see companies do is say things like, I wanna understand why black talent are less engaged. Let's ask the black talent. I wanna understand what makes someone a top performer. Let's study the top performers. 
Okay, but you're missing part of the picture, an important part of the picture. Instead, ask all groups about engagement and then compare the reports from black employees, Asian employees, et cetera, and study all performers and then compare top, mid, et cetera. Why do this? Well, this is not obvious, but we're, and it's very common. We want to look at people who have the outcome we want and see what they do and emulate it. So I interviewed, you know, a hundred high achievers about their morning routines and I want to learn something. So let's look at successful people and see what we can learn from them that they all do. We see this a lot with age, right? Pe these people have lived to 100. What do they all have in common? Usually it's that they have a martini every day at five or something like that. And what we're missing by only looking at people who live to 100 is all the people who also had a martini every day and did not live to 100 or all the people who are not morning risers or who are morning risers and who aren't successful or whatever, right? And if you think this is like an outdated thing that no one does anymore, this is literally a headline from the New York Times not too long ago. This 105 year old beat COVID. She credits gin soaked raisins. So we've got some sample size issues, but again, what do all the people who've beaten COVID have in common? <laughs> gin soaked raisins, but okay, I'm not a medic. We'll get Dr. Fauci to weigh in on those. I will not go into these in detail, but I would be remiss if I didn't list a number of other further grievances that I have. Uh, it, since we're digital, you can take a screenshot uh, and find me on Twitter or in a, a networking session, and I'm happy to talk to you about them. Generally speaking, the punchline is dashboards are overrated. Data-driven insights are not a real thing. Humans find insights using data, okay? We are steering it and our biases and our everything else are involved. And when in doubt, before you invest in fancy methods, please invest in better data. So recapping, I gave you five simple techniques to make the most of your people data. And you might be saying now, great, Andrea, but how am I gonna remember these? Well, I have a handy guide. But humble but not afraid, humility, hypotheses, histograms, happenstance, becoming less obsessed with statistical, and the full picture. So you can think of these as the five H's uh, and I, you'll never uh, go astray with your data again. So the five H's of simple and effective people data research. Feel free to share this on Twitter as hashtag 5H or hashtag HHHHH. I don't know if 5H means something else. I know 4H is taken, but hopefully not. All right, thank you very much. Uh, have a great rest of the conference.